There's nothing like motivations in life to get you to do something you need to do. Some motivations are positive, while some are negative in nature. So, for example, there's nothing like a heart attack to motivate you to live a healthier lifestyle. There's nothing like a strict piano teacher, like my very first piano teacher, who will hit you on your hand with a stick if you played the wrong notes to motivate you to practice hard every day. There's nothing like the fear of failing a grade level or being held back a year while all of your friends graduate to motivate you to study really hard on your final exams. There's nothing like being reprimanded, embarrassed by your boss in front of everyone or the possibility of losing your job to motivate you to come to work on time and to perform well. There's nothing like the threat from your parents to take away privilege like access to Netflix or YouTube or the internet to motivate you to listen and obey them. And as for myself, nothing like an angry wife who tells me to cook my own food for dinner to motivate me to be nice to her and treat her well. What are some of your motivations to live forth a Christ-like life as a follower of Jesus Christ? At times, it can be extremely hard to stay the course, meaning to stand firm in pursuing a goal or a course of action, to persevere in the face of whatever challenges or obstacles you may encounter. This phrase, stay the course, was first used in print in the late 1900s to refer to a horse on a racetrack enduring the race and running in a straight line, not being distracted, and reaching the finish line, hopefully, to win the race. There are many worldly distractions in life that causes us to pull away from setting our sights focused on the one singular goal of honoring the Lord and glorifying God through how we faithfully live out our Christian life and running well this race called life. To encourage us to do so, the Scripture is full of reasons and motivations for why we should stay the course for our own good because it is how we persevere as followers of Jesus Christ in challenging times like the one we are living today, where we can serve as a testimony to the world for what a relationship with Christ means. As we continue our study in the book of Joshua in our series entitled Courage in the Crucible, we want to see what are some motivations to stay the course in order to persevere through the challenges and the trials of life in order to live this life without being distracted by the temporary and counterfeit solutions that the world offers to life's problems. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Joshua chapter 23 as we take a look at verses 1 to 16. Joshua chapter 23, verses 1 to 16, as we take a look at three motivations that God gives the people of Israel to stay the course and follow Him, which can also be applied to our Christian lives today. As I mentioned earlier, biblical principles for motivations can either be positive in nature or negative. And in this chapter in Joshua, God will use three negative motivations to get the people of Israel and us to stay the course. I read now from Joshua chapter 23, verses 1 to 5. Now it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua was old, advanced in age. And Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in age. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is He who has fought for you. See, I have divided to you by lot these nations that remain, to be an inheritance for your tribes, from the Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward." And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight. So you shall possess the land as the Lord your God promised you. What we have here is that Joshua gathers the leaders of the people of Israel as he neared the end of his life. And he reminded the leaders that it is God who has helped them conquer much of the promised land. Although Joshua is the one who led them in this conquest, notice that Joshua doesn't take any credit for the victories over the pagan Canaanite nations. Joshua recounted in verse 4 how he had divided the land among the 12 tribes of Israel, but that there was still work to be done to drive out the remaining pagan people living in their allocated land. Again, Joshua reminded them in verse 5 that it is the Lord who will be the enablement that will give these tribes victory over the nations, and that the land of Canaan is theirs to take 
because it has been promised to them by God, the one who is sovereign over all lands. With this charge to Israel's leaders to continue the work tasked to them and to finish the conquest of the promised land by driving away these pagan peoples, Joshua now gives the leaders three motivational warnings that they need to heed in order to stay the course and to follow God's commands. And these three warnings are things we need to heed as well as we also try to stay the course and persevere through these challenging times as we continue to follow the Lord, exemplifying a Christ-like life. The first warning is in verses 6 to 8. Look with me. Therefore, be very courageous to keep to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. Unless you go among these nations, these who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. Here Joshua reminds the leaders again to keep the commandments of God given in the Mosaic laws and not to waver from it, turning neither to the right or to the left. But then he adds that they were not to mingle with the remaining pagan people of the land, who at this point they were still not yet able to fully drive away. Why is there this admonition to stay away from the pagan Canaanite peoples? Because Joshua knew the strength of their influence over the Israelites if they were to associate with them. That is why there is no ambiguity in this admonition to avoid associating and mingling with these pagan peoples. Joshua lays it out for them very clearly in verse 7 and says they were not even to mention the names of their false gods. Why? Not because they were to fear these false gods as ones who are not to be named lest something happens, but mentioning these names would perhaps pique the people's interest in these false gods. It would perhaps normalize and familiarize the people with them. So, for example, I grew up in North Texas at a time where there were very few Asians. For many of my Texan friends, I was their first exposure to someone who was Chinese, much less someone who was Asian. They grew up not knowing that for the vast majority of the world, rice is the main source of starch that is paired with food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. For them, it was breads and potatoes. So it was very exotic and unique for them to come over to our house to play and then have dinner with us. And instead of having breads and potatoes, my mom, of course, prepared rice. It was definitely not normal for them. But fast forward 30 years later, and with Asian-based corporations moving their headquarters to North Texas like Toyota, there's a huge influx of Asians over the past three decades and with that Asian cuisine. So now when I return back to Texas and I get together with my American Caucasian friends for dinner, they will tell me, we're going to bring you to either a Chinese, Korean, Japanese, or Thai restaurant, which they will say is now their favorite. Of course, I'm wanting to go to a steak place because I get Asian food every day here in the Philippines. But my point is that somehow something that was so unique and so special to them has now become familiar. It was now normalized in their culture. So if the Israelites did not mention the names of these pagan gods, then it will not be normal for them when they are exposed to the names of these gods. Now, that doesn't mean they were to pretend these gods didn't exist, but they were simply not to normalize it. Then the Bible tells us they were not to be used to be sworn by, meaning they were not to be given any recognition or legitimacy. You see, in the ancient Near East, they would often swear on their deity to bind one's word or perhaps to complete a, a contract or an agreement. They would swear by their gods, and perhaps the Israelite would swear by the name of Yahweh, the one true God. So if the Israelite was to enter into an agreement with the pagan Canaanites, one would swear by the name of Yahweh, while the other would swear by the name of this false deity. And so now both the true God and the false gods were on equal footing. But yet there's only one true God. The other false god do not have equal footing. So likewise, in our current context, Jesus is not one among many saviors. He is the only true savior of the world. 
Sadly, the acceptance and the legitimizing of the occultic things, the satanic things, the worldly things, the evil things, is now part of our culture today. Satan, that great deceiver of the world, has somehow made his false worldviews normal and accepted in our culture, while the truth of the Christian worldview is now viewed as not being legitimate on the fringe or as an outlier. And so witches and warlocks are no longer figures to be shunned or repulsed, but are now somehow accepted and even celebrated as part of our culture, while Jesus and His teachings are somehow treated with disdain as if non-inclusive, not loving, harsh, and simply unacceptable. The Bible tells us the people were not to serve or bow down to these false pagan gods of the Canaanites. That's what Joshua tells them at the end of verse 7. What he was trying to say was that there was to be no compromise between the worship of the one true God and the worship of the false pagan Canaanite gods. There is to be no compromise, and this no compromise theme is echoed throughout Scripture. In the New Testament, it is very clear. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve between God and the world. You must pick one. But sadly, we have forgotten this principle in our generation today. We think it is possible to straddle and to live in both worlds, to be a strong Christian, but also to accept the things of the world. But yet, the reality is they come with two different worldviews, two different standards. When you try to straddle both worlds, in reality, you are being drawn away from Christ and you are being drawn to the world because of the world's very strong influence. So putting it all together... Number one of your taking notes, stay the course, stay the course, number one, a warning not to normalize, legitimize, or compromise with false worldviews. A warning not to normalize, legitimize, or compromise with false worldviews. This important biblical principle is because of the strength and the pull of the world's influence. That is why the Bible encourages us always to focus on the truth of God's Word, to focus our minds and our hearts solely on the Lord. There can only be one guide. There can only be one source of truth. It is the Word of God that is normal. It is the Word of God that is legitimate. It is the Word of God that is truth, and it is the Word of God that should be fully accepted. But the world's influence and us succumbing to false worldviews will cause us to think that the Bible and what it teaches are not normal, and somehow it's not legitimate because it's written so many centuries ago that it cannot be accepted because of the so-called myths and the inaccuracies that fill the Bible. Of course, those are all lies from the evil one. Joshua recognized the great influence of the pagan society over the Israelite community, so he wanted God's people not to be influenced to have a separation so as not to normalize or legitimize their beliefs. There was to be no compromise. My friends, are you influenced by the false worldviews that surround us in our culture today? Have you legitimized what God's Word says is not to be accepted? Have you normalized a way of living that the Bible speaks against? Have you compromised your stance in certain areas of life? If I were to ask you, what is your opinion on divorce and annulment, would you tell me it's okay because they were so unhappy in their married life, as if unhappiness is the basis for the disillusionment of marriage? Or would you tell me that God hates divorce and only reluctantly allows for it in the case of adultery because of man's sinfulness? Or if I were to ask you, what is your opinion on sex and the expression of love and intimacy? Would you tell me it's only to be expressed in the beauty of a marriage relationship between one man and one woman? Or would you just tell me, just go with the flow? If you can find someone you love, you can freely express that love through intimacy with anyone, anytime. There is no mistake if love is the basis. Or if I asked you, what are your thoughts on the LGBTQ plus lifestyle? Do you give me the principles of the Scriptures that speak about God's love for all people, but His desire for all to live in holiness? Or do you tell me everyone has the right to do whatever they want to for love and simply do what your heart tells you? Now, I can go on and on, but we have to admit, the world 
has influenced us in ways we may not even be aware of because of how a false worldview is being slowly but surely ingrained into our culture through its normalization, through its legitimization, and through the compromise of our beliefs. Joshua's warning was so that the people of Israel can stay the course in following God to allow them to be aware of what the pagan culture can do to them. Joshua's warning is also applicable to us today as the Bible is being attacked like never before. We are to hold fast and stay the course. We are to be aware that there is a false worldview that is working its way into our culture and affecting how we view the Scriptures and how we live out our lives. Look at me now at verses 9 to 11. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations, but as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. Therefore, take careful heed to yourself that you love the Lord your God. Again, Joshua reminds the people in verses 9 and 10 that it was the Lord who drove the pagan nations out of the promised land. It was His enablement that allowed one man figuratively to go up against a thousand because the Israelites were so overwhelmingly outnumbered, but they still won the victory. And the key phrase in that section is in verse 10. Would you underline and highlight that phrase? For the Lord your God is He who fights for you as He promised. This is the key to Israel's victory and success because God fights for them. And we have seen this throughout the book of Joshua. But now there's a charge in verse 11 that they were to continue to love the Lord your God, meaning their loyalty and their alignment is to be with the living God or else Look what will happen in verses 12 and 13. Or else, if indeed you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go in to them and they to you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourge on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. The Bible tells us if they were to somehow turn to the pagan gods of the Canaanite people who were still in the land, and if they were to intermingle and intermarry with them, which meant a close association with them and their false gods, then the Lord will no longer help them to victory. Verse 13 is very clear. It says that the Lord will no longer drive them out of the land, and without God's enablement, they will not find victory. They will not have success. In fact, these pagan nations, the Bible says, will trap you. They will punish you, and at the end, it will lead to their destruction. You see, Joshua was telling the people of Israel and us who are reading this today to stay the course by giving them a second warning, warning number two, a warning of an end to God-aided success if one associates with the enemy. A warning of an end to God-aided success if one associates with the enemy. If one chooses to associate with pagans and to be close to them and to abandon the one true God, then they should know that God's help and enablement may end. Yes, God is gracious. God is merciful. God is loving. God is forgiving. But His patience does have a limit because God is also holy and righteous, and He is rightfully jealous of His children who choose to associate with the enemy. You know, in war, we call people like these traitors. But why is it in the Christian life we tell God, God, I hope you understand why I had to betray you. I hope it's okay with you that I'm disloyal to you and somehow expect Him to always still give blessings to us. That's simply not right. I think this should be a warning and a wake-up call for many of us today who want to abuse God's grace to think that we can do whatever we want to do and that there be no consequence. It is not that I want to keep on preaching the consequences of sin versus focusing on the grace and the love of a forgiving God. Both are taught in Scriptures. There should be a balance in its preachings but it is important to warn about the consequences of sin and associating with the enemy because not doing so would be a great disservice since the Bible is always warning about such things. 
So examine your life. It could be that you don't have God's blessings or you're not able to overcome sin and temptation because you have abandoned the Lord. You have associated with the enemy and so the Lord withdrew His God-aided success and He's withdrawn victory in your life. I remember in high school, there was a girl who moved from another state to Texas and spoke with a very heavy southern drawl. Being new and with her thick accent, she didn't have any friends. We were in a couple of classes together, but I remember in Spanish class how the kids used to make fun of her as she tried to speak Spanish with her heavy southern drawl. So I befriended her and showed her kindness. I introduced her to my friends and brought her into my circles. Well, she thrived and she blossomed and was able to get plugged into many clubs, and including cheerleading, and became quite popular herself. In her popularity, I guess she no longer had any use for me and my friendship. So we were no longer running in the same circles. We were no longer friends. Years later, irony of ironies, I ended up interviewing her and doing the initial screening as she applied for a prestigious management consulting position in the company I worked for. Let me put it this way. Do you think I did her any favors? What would you do if you were in my position? It can happen in any relationship, like in a marriage relationship or in a dating situation. If a person has a mistress or is emotionally attached to someone else while dating you or addicted to pornography, do you think that the other party is going to do you any favors if he or she finds out? In the same way, our loving and forgiving God is under no obligation to give you God-aided success or victories in life when you and I associate with the enemies. In fact, throughout Scripture, a constant theme emerges— If you obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, I will discipline you. It doesn't mean God abandons us, but it simply shows that at times His hands of blessings may be taken away and we shouldn't be surprised. And if you and I don't ever want to be in a situation where His hand of blessing has been lifted and instead His hand of discipline is upon us, then we better not associate with the enemy. We have to remember that the Lord freely gives and graciously gives, but He can just as easily, quickly take those things away. I think we often forget this truth principle in our grace-oriented theology. God's rightful, righteous anger towards sin is such that if we have idols in our lives or associate with the enemy, He will pull away as a holy God does not associate with sin. So be warned, God's success, victories, and blessings in your life may end if you're going to continue to associate with the things of the world. And don't blame God even when it happens. You only have yourself to blame. Look with me now at verse 14. Behold, this day I'm going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. Joshua again reminds the leaders that God has been a very faithful God. He has not failed in giving Israel all that He has promised to give them. He has kept up His end of the bargain in His relationship with His covenanted people. He is someone who is trustworthy. In a relationship, if someone is faithful to you, then the natural expectation is that the other party in the relationship is also faithful in return. When you hear a story about an unfaithful spouse who is cheating on his wife, who has been very faithful to her husband, and then you are asked, what should we do to that no good man? I think many of you would say, to that unfaithful person, he should be punished. He must be made to suffer greatly. Look at this woman, so faithful to her husband, and look what her husband did. But what if, in this scenario, you find out that the wife really wasn't so innocent because she was also cheating on her husband when he was cheating on her. And if I were to ask you, knowing this additional information, what should you do to this no good man? You would probably answer nothing. Nothing should be done because his wife was cheating on him as well. So both deserve what they deserve. You see how your attitudes change. With this in mind, you will see how different it is in our relationship with God. He is the one who has never, ever failed us. But we have often adulterated ourselves to the world, and so we would deserve the punishment we get, right? 
Remember how you responded when you remember that one was faithful and one wasn't faithful. Now, with this thought, I read now verses 15 to 16. Therefore, it shall come to pass that as all the good things have come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so the Lord will bring upon you all harmful things until he has destroyed you from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given you. Joshua reminded the people that if they served the other false pagan gods of the Canaanites and bowed to them and in effect were unfaithful to God, not only will they not have God aided blessings and victories, they will be also severely disciplined. If you simply read verses 15 to 16 without remembering that God has been eternally faithful to them, then you will wonder why God is so harsh on them. But if you know that someone has been so unwaveringly faithful and one has completely adulterated themselves to false gods in the world, then these are just disciplines and just punishments for people who abandon God. And we know Israel's history, and we know that they will indeed be exiled and removed from the land as punishment for abandoning God. This should be a warning for us to stay the course, warning number three, a warning of God's discipline if His children abandon Him. A warning of God's discipline if His children abandon Him. For the children of Israel, their discipline often takes the place of being removed from the promised land. We see this historically for the northern tribe in 722 B.C. by the Assyrian army and for the southern half in 586 B.C. by the forces of Babylon. And so God does discipline if His children abandon Him. Let that be a warning for us to stay the course and keep our focus on Him. I'm reminded of a story that took place on the early morning of February 17, 1994. James Rich got into his new twin-engine Piper Seneca airplane at an airport near Louisville, Kentucky. The plan was to make a, a short 30-minute flight to Crossville, Tennessee to visit a friend. But he hadn't slept much the night before. So as his plane left the runway, he was pretty tired. After climbing 3,500 feet, he put the plane on automatic pilot, and then he fell asleep. When he woke up three hours later, he was in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, 200 miles from land, and he was running out of fuel. The engine sputtered, then crashed into the Gulf of Mexico. The plane sank in 45 seconds. Rich, who could not swim, was pulled under by the undertow. The only thing that saved him was two discount store cushions he clutched under his arms. When they found him, he was alive, embarrassed, minus one 70,000 uninsured airplane, and still holding on to two cheap cushions under his arms. James Rich fell asleep at the wheel and literally flew off course. This story is a vivid reminder that as Christians, we do the same thing with even more serious consequences. We trust in our own selves. We trust in our feeble strength. We trust in our own abilities to control our lives. But because we've abandoned God, we don't have His enabling power. And so we fall asleep at the helm of our own life. And when God disciplines us because we've abandoned Him, we wonder why we're simply floating in life, barely able to tread water with lots of damage left behind because we have tried to do it ourselves and God has to discipline us. But remember, my friends, when God disciplines us, it comes out of His love. His discipline is to bring us back to Himself. It's just like a parent's discipline. It's not to scar us forever or to hurt us permanently. It is a loving discipline to correct our wrong ways and to break our will so that we will recognize who is in authority and who is in charge. Even though God often expelled the people of Israel from the promised land, He lovingly brings them back in forgiveness. Recently, a, a new parent asked me how we disciplined our children growing up. He had a very strong-willed little girl who was going through her terrible fours and fives and simply would not listen. 
We went through those years with our children, and I shared some practical things we did. While we employed all forms of disciplinary measures to lovingly correct our children, including spanking, for our family, one of the most effective ways was for our children to stand in what we call the naughty square as punishment. They were to stand in that square and not to leave that square. They could do anything they wanted to, yell, scream, cry, make faces, call us names, as long as they did not leave that square as they threw their tantrum and we didn't mind them. With the strong-willed children that we had, because their father was also strong-willed, they would try to prove that standing in that square would not break them. But eventually, it broke them because they could not move. They could not sit. They could not eat. They could not play with their toys. They could not watch television. They could not get hugs or kisses. They could just simply stand there. Eventually, they realized after hours that it wasn't fun being in that naughty square. And they realized it was more fun and for their betterment that they lived in obedience to their parents and they could enjoy sitting down, enjoy watching television or playing with their toys, enjoy eating snacks and food and other things. In the same way, if we want to abandon God, He will discipline us and say, well, if you want to do whatever you want to do, then go right ahead, but you can enjoy the blessings that I give you. And so just as Israel was kicked out of the land, the blessed promised land, whenever they needed to be disciplined, God places us in a place where we can live in our rebellion, but it is in a very nice place. And hopefully it won't be years until we come to that realization. It would only be days or hours or hopefully minutes that when we live outside of God's beautiful plan, then it is really to our detriment. We think that if we live in our rebellion, we will enjoy life but you and I need to understand, if that's the pride of your heart, then you'll quickly find out that it is not for your good. Let your will be broken and live in obedience so that you can enjoy the good things of life. Stay the course so that you will not be under God's discipline. Let me end with this story. It seems that one day a kindergarten teacher was helping one of her students put on his shoes. He had asked the teacher for help, and she could see why he needed help. Even with her pulling and him pushing, the little shoe still didn't want to go in. They got one shoe on. Finally, when the second shoe was on, she had worked up a sweat. She almost cried when the little boy said, Teacher, they're on the wrong foot. She looked down, and sure enough, the shoes were on the wrong feet. It wasn't any easier pulling the shoes off than it was putting them on, but she managed to keep her cool together as they worked to get the shoes back on, this time on the right feet. It was only then that he announced, Teacher, these aren't my shoes. She bit her tongue rather than scream. Why didn't you say so? Like she wanted to yell. And once again, she struggled to help him pull the ill-fitting shoes off his little feet. No sooner had they gotten the shoes off when he said, Teacher, they're not my shoes, they're my brother's shoes. My mom made me wear them today. Stifling a scream, she muttered up the grace and courage she had left to wrestle the ill-fitting shoes back onto his feet again. Helping him into his coat, she asked, Now, son, where are your mittens? To which he replied, Teacher, I stuffed them in the toes of my shoes. Maybe that's why the shoes were so hard to wear. That teacher sure had a challenging day, but she stayed the course. This story reminds me of the challenges Christians must face in this crazy, mixed-up world where things in life don't make sense, where right is wrong and wrong is right, where people simply don't understand us, where common sense and rational thoughts are simply thrown out the window and people make decisions on half-truths and lies. And yes, we are still called to stay the course. In life, there are many distractions that take us away from running the race straight until the end, crossing the finish line, looking solely at the author and the perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. But remember, that is our goal, to run correctly, to finish the race marked for us by Christ. As the Apostle Paul 
tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 to 8, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. So remember some of these motivations for staying the course as you run towards the finish line. A warning not to normalize, legitimize, or compromise with false worldviews. A warning of an end to God-aided success if one associates with the enemy. A warning of God's discipline if His children abandon Him. So my prayer is that each of us will stay the course with these three warnings serving as motivations and, of course, the other motivations in Scripture to look to the Lord and to shun the things of the world because our hope and victory is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who desires to give us all good things from above in accordance with His will. Stay the course, my friend. Stay the course. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your Word. We admit, and I admit, that there are times I veer off course because of the pull of the world, because of the temptations of life. Lord, I pray that we would heed the warnings of Joshua chapter 23. I pray that we would live our lives in such a way that we will never normalize, legitimize, or compromise our faith with the false worldviews that seem to bombard our culture. I pray that we would be reminded that if we associate with the enemies, that we may lose out on God-aided success. We want to live in your victory. We want to live in your success. Father, help us not to abandon you because we do not want to incur your discipline. We want to receive your blessing. You desire to give us all good things from above in accordance with your will. And so we experience it when we live in obedience. So help us to stay the course. Help us to persevere even to the crucibles of our life the trials, the challenges, help us to keep our focus on the author and the finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.